Right. Okay. So uh, last class, does anyone remember what we what we studied in Corinthians? No chance, huh? <laughs> okay, so we stopped at chapter 5, right? Chapter 5. Uh, and uh, today we are going to look at chapter 6. Right? Um, so chapter 5, uh, we saw what Paul was referring to um, about... Uh, yeah, so we, we, we saw a very important um, aspect, which is um, like how he deals, how he, or how he dealt with... Um, this person who was living in willful sexual sin and uh, how he it was dealt with. Right? So on the face of it, we see that, yes, it seems very harsh because that person was actually, the words he uses um, were, might be shocking. He said, you know, I delivered such a one to Satan so that his flesh might be destroyed so that he might, uh, his spirit might be saved on, on, that, on that day. And so, um, but we see that the heart of it is actually restoration, right? Because when we when we study this, um, what is that delivering up to Satan in order for the flesh to be destroyed, etc., is is actually putting out of fellowship, right? bringing uh, uh, um, that person, allowing that person not to be in the fellowship of the, com of the community of the church, uh, so that it can be restorative in nature, right? So that the person might come to a place of repentance. Now, that was the intention. And it was also, secondly, um, not to allow the church or the body of believers to be affected by this kind of a lifestyle, right? So he talks about leaven and how a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? So he talks about that. And then, so he says that, yes, this is, this is the intention. You need to be careful. So it because there is this whole process of normalizing sin that happens, right? Saying, okay, this is normal, this is this is fine, this person is living like this, so therefore I also can. So we lower our own standards when we normalize sin in other people's lives. So so um so Paul's um dealing with that particular uh you know, sin, that challenge uh, in that church, in the Corinthian church, right? So today, let's look at uh, chapter 6, right? Chapter 6, if we see, um, we'll read from uh, verses 1 to 8, right? There are, again, three sections we can actually uh, divide it into for the purpose of study. One is resolving disputes between believers, right? Believers were having, so church believers were having uh, difficulties, challenges with each other, Though they were, they were having some disputes, and then he reminds them how they were all washed and sanctified and justified, and then he warns them to stay away from sexual sin. Right. So, so let's uh, look at verses one to eight. So, dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world, and if the world will be judged by you? Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so <coughs> Excuse me, that there is not a wise man among you? No, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, now, uh, it's utter failure. Why do you not rather accept wrong why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Okay. So what is Paul addressing here? Is he's talking about uh, a situation that is happening in the Corinthian church where there are a lot of um, people who are taking others to the court, right, to the court of law, and... Uh, in the Roman culture or in the Roman times, 
um, particularly in Corinth, they had this raised platform in the marketplace where these cases will be heard and presented. Right, So any legal case would be presented in this. It was called the Bema or the judgment seat. Right, So, so there will be a judge, there will be um, a proconsul or someone um, appointed by the uh, Roman uh, uh, authorities and they would hear the legal proceedings and they will pass a judgment. Okay, Now it was in the center of the city, it was in the marketplace and there would be others, you know, general public, for them it was a kind of an entertainment. They would come, listen to what is being said uh, and uh, you know get to know about everything. So it was open to the general public as well, right? So, so this was this is was something that was there in the 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 Romans uh, in Corinth, right? Now, <clears throat> if we you know, so Paul is saying you know, don't you know that um, the saints or the consecrated ones, you know, you will judge the world. You will judge the world, and not only the world, but he also says that, don't you know that you will judge angels now? Now, in what capacity uh, will the believers you know, judge angels? We don't know. Right? But we know that, um, that we have, in, in our, as people who are born again, like we are seated with him in the heavenly places. Right? We have been given a privilege um, that is not there for angels for any of the heavenly beings right we are seated with him in the heavenly places uh, in Christ Jesus and so we don't know right but the fact is that he very clearly states that you know you you will judge the world you will judge the angels and also referring to the the millennial reign of Christ where the believers will be given authority and um, the Bible says that we will be called to judge the world right so so he's saying okay now this is happening right you are Taking believers, and uh, you are having things against each other, and and the thing is that he's saying, why can't you settle it between yourselves? You know, is there is there any difficulty in settling between yourselves peacefully, uh, so that you don't have to drag another uh, believer to the court, and the people in authority were definitely not believers in Christ Jesus, right? They were they were unbelievers who had a different set of standards altogether. So he's saying, you know, do you want to do that? And uh, do you need to do this? Right. So he's asking them. And the question uh, uh, really is this, you know, what? why can't you settle it within yourselves? Uh, and even if it, if it means that you need to sacrifice, you know, that's the challenge that he's asked, saying, putting forth, saying, you know, even if it means that you need to let go, you know, you need to, let allow yourself be wrong, you know. Why can't you do that? Why can't you have that frame of mind? Okay, which uh, uh, which they were not willing to go do that because they were by themselves cheating and doing wrong to others. You know, maybe it was in the case of business, maybe it was in you know other areas, certain, uh, you know, pertaining to property and so on. So they were doing this with other believers. Okay, now the question for us as believers is. This, you know, when we read this and we, we see, then, uh, you know, why should you go to a court of law and do you not know that you yourself will judge, etc.? The question for us is can't we go as believers, as the church, um, to a court of law in order to get justice, right? So that's the question, right? So what do you think? Is it okay to go to the court of law to? To get justice, um, or is it wrong? What do you think? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I think biblically it's uh, wrong. Biblically, it's wrong. Like if you go, because according to the word, saying let go. If even though if you're think you're right, also mm. let go. Uh, but in the natural, we are not seeing it. Maybe people are there who are doing it very rare. Mm. Okay, so we, we can actually look at um, see the court of law is for justice. We know the system, judicial system. Um, well, there are good people, and we know that there are 
you know uh, the whole system is corrupted uh, and that's the reality uh, like in a country like, like ours uh, you know it's it's not only is it corrupted but it's also long drawn right uh, and and so on okay so in the context of the corinthian church and corinth we see that it was actually bringing a, a, a you know dishonor to the church itself right because it was in such public view that these cases were dealt with it's not you know it's not in a private setting it's a public setting and in the marketplace and everyone would gather around and um, so that was how it was dealt with so the testimony of believers everything was called into question you know the so the witness the testimony everything was suffering because of that okay that is one thing the second thing is also that they were not dealing in a right manner with each other right so they were with the intention of cheating and lying and and uh, maybe you know wanting to covet other people's properties and position uh, i mean and so on material things and so on so they were intentionally doing this right uh, so those are that is the context in which we see right and if we actually um if you look at you know what we discussed last class also if you look at matthew chapter 15 right matthew chapter 15 where uh, the lord is teaching uh, the disciples and he says okay this is how you need to deal if a brother wrongs you okay matthew 15 and uh, i think it's verse 18 right um or is it matthew 18 15 just one second sorry yeah mate sorry it's the other way matthew 18 and verse 15 yeah, i think it's there in the notes also yeah matthew 18 verse 15 okay so it says um, let me just read through it if your brother sins against you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone okay if he hears you you have gained your brother if he will not hear take with you one or more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established and if he refuses to hear them tell it to the church but if he refuses even to hear the church let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector okay so what is the lord saying lord is saying you know you do it in stages right you first go personally tell the person hey, what you're doing is wrong this is not correct then Uh, if he's not listening you take two or three witnesses again the same thing then also if he's not listening to a wider you know group that to the entire church and if he's not willing to listen to the church then he says you know you treat him like a uh, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector you know you don't have any fellowship with him because this is how you know he's really not heard or not listen to wise counsel is not repented so in the light of this yes the question for <clears throat> the challenge the question for us is okay have we followed through with this process right let's say somebody wrongs us uh is talk we are talking about believers again right we're talking about a fellow believer that's that's another important thing we're talking about a fellow believer who also believes in the, in the lord etc but for re- some reason has wrong us okay so have we followed this these steps and right? have we gone and told that person as he listen have we gone with the two or three witnesses have we gone with maybe the, the fellowship of believers the church uh, maybe the leadership of the church and so on so have you done that so if that person is still unwilling okay then you know then we could we need justice we could you know Uh, go to a court of law and that choice is left to us right we can't force it right so now if let's say you you choose you decide okay um okay this is something i'm willing to let go i'm willing to forgive i'm willing to overlook this and and move on that choice is also left to us the choice is left to us whether we want to take that person to court um and uh, or if you want to let go and be a peacemaker right so so that is the, that is left to us now i've i've also practically seen that in action where uh you know there were a couple of these employee 
employees and the believers, the employer also a believer, and the employees had actually done something wrong. You know, they'd gone behind the back and done some deals and uh, got some money, etc. So the employer came to know about it, had the facts right in front, right in the hand. But bo being believers, they called for a meeting with um, with the leadership of the church and 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 addressed this thing and said, okay, so this is what has happened, you know. What do you think? Um, initially, the person, uh, and this is all something that I've heard. Like initially, the person was not willing to uh, accept the wrong. Said, no, 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 I did. we did not do it. That, that did not happen. But then the facts were presented. The evidence was given. And then uh, said, because it was so serious that if it went, if it was a complaint that was given, definitely that person would have been put behind bars, right? put in prison. Or, or it, uh, at least it, it would have been a heavy, heavy penalty. The reputation would have gone, etc. And it could have been easily done overnight. Right? But the employer chose to take this path. And so when confronted, when given with the uh, evidence, that person repented. That person said yes, you know, uh, because the evidence was there. So we don't know if the evidence were not given, would he still continue to say no, defend himself, whatever. So this was done, person repented, and uh, the employer also you know, forgave and said, fine. But you know, it's a warning. You cannot continue in the organization, and, uh, you know, and so on. There were some consequences for that. Right? Um, you, know, you needed to repay whatever amount, whatsoever. Um, I don't know the details. But the thing is this, that this step was taken um, because it was among believers right so it's a choice it's a choice that is for us so that is something that we can learn and so paul is you know telling the corinthian believers um, one they should not wrong each other they should not teach i mean sorry cheat each other wrong uh, each other and put all these kind of lawsuits uh, each other reason being that they are judged by someone who is not a believer and so you know why do you want to make a spectacle of all this a public spectacle uh, in right there in the marketplace and so that was his um, reason for presenting such such a instruction right so so that's something that we see here okay any questions on this thoughts now do you have any doubts Okay, so as a believer, they, they try to solve, they better try to solve matters between themselves peacefully. Yeah. So yeah, so we have that option of going to it, it's it's not like we cannot just get justice from the you know the judicial system of the land. So uh, we know that we can always do that, but when it comes to a matter of uh, two believers, when it comes to a matter of you know, maybe two believers going to the worshiping in the same church and that is the situation here and so paul uh, suggests that this right okay let's move on okay. so then uh, paul re reminds you know then okay you yourselves are cheating you are also doing wrong and you do this to one another to your brethren right that's verse 8 to 9 okay do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators idolaters adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, so, um, so he is putting a list of things and he's saying, hey, you cannot continue doing these things you cannot continue in this manner you cannot continue with this kind of a lifestyle if at all you know um, you are you are doing this then the bible is very clear that if this becomes a lifestyle right um, then the kingdom of god is not for such people right? you cannot inherit the kingdom right and he's saying you know this this is the kind of lifestyle you had earlier like this is the kind of lifestyle you had this is the kind of you know, um, sin that you were actually involved in 
adultery and you know some of some of these sins are sexual in nature some of these are uh, has have to do with the, excuse me <clears throat> have to do with the attitude right some of these are you know behavior a covetous attitude revilers someone who's abusive and cursing and you know telling all sorts of things against another person extortioner like uh, so these were the kind of people kind of lifestyle they had and then he says you know you have been washed you have been sanctified and you have been justified so when you came to the lord jesus even though these kind of terrible wickedness or terrible lifestyle is something that you had you were washed okay so he uses the word washed which means completely you know wash the whole person wash clean and uh, it's figuratively said washes because we've been forgiven and our sins have been taken away by the blood of jesus by that sacrifice right and he also says sanctified sanctified meaning to set apart consecrate to be separate from sin and separate to live a holy life unto god right so um, we've been consecrated then thirdly we've been justified so that is a legal term meaning you've been declared not guilty you've been declared unright you've been declared as someone who is not uh, uh, someone who is righteous someone who is not unrighteous right and it is a verdict that has been pr pronounced so the lord has justified us and this justification has come to us freely in christ jesus right romans chapter 8 uh, romans chapter 3 23 in right? so Romans chapter 3 23 that all have fallen short of the glory of God um Romans 3 23 all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness and so on so we see that this justification right to be declared as not guilty has come freely right so he does that today so so he's saying you know this is how you were but this has been given to you you've been washed you've been justified you've been consecrated therefore do not go back to that old lifestyle and going into that old lifestyle if it becomes part of you there is this danger of a person coming to a place of even rejecting christ now that is what he's saying you know he's saying such people having this lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of god so how does one inherit the kingdom of god that's the question right how does one inherit the kingdom of god what is the answer how does one inherit the kingdom of god yeah. go ahead francis a simple question <clears throat> inherit the kingdom inherit meaning you you know you receive inheritance you you receive the inheritance from god for me like more intimacy with god sorry more intimacy with god uh -huh. okay or like when i like for myself like um, when i like when i want to talk to god like when i receive want something for me is like just to worship hmm so i worshiping him even like when my prayer time also like more time it will go for worship as kind of worship that's all hmm. I... yeah that, see that's the lifestyle of a person who has inherited the kingdom of god right so that's your your what you're talking about is worship and prayer and you know it's a lifestyle of someone who has come into the kingdom of god what the bible says that we have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and released into the kingdom of god into the kingdom of the son of his light so right now are we in the kingdom of god or not yes yes <laughs> yeah okay so so the, so that's the question okay so i see a lot of responses here online as well uh shivak mar yes we are the kingdom of god okay by believing and following jesus keeping our faith in him says prince 
uh, those who believe in the Lord Jesus are translated into the kingdom of God. Yes, Nina. By living according to God's word. Yeah. So living according to God's word, being children of God, being children of God, you know, that change in identity and change in kingdom. <clears throat> okay. When we say kingdom, what are, what are we talking about? The rule and reign. The rule and reign of the king, the domain, the geographical region of the rule and reign of the king. That's the kingdom, right? So now we have been translated out of some kingdom of out of uh, another kingdom, kingdom of darkness, and we have been placed in the kingdom of God, kingdom of you know um, light. So we are already placed. So how did we get there? It was only because of grace, right? By grace, through faith. Faith in what? Faith in the, what the Lord Jesus did for us. Okay, so that's the thing. So now, if somebody has a lifestyle of this, you know, he lists down, you know, idolatry and reviling and um, you know fornication and and so on. So if anyone has a lifestyle of this, there is a very strong possibility. When you say lifestyle, it has become part of my life. It has become a regular part of my life. Right? It has become a regular habit, regular part of my life. Right, so if someone has this, then the danger is that you reach a point where you reject Christ. So that is, so when, once you reject Christ, then that is when you know you lose, you lose all that you have gained because of grace, right? And so he's talking about that Paul's possibility, that seriousness of it, the serious. Possible the, the reality of such a thing happening. So he's saying those who practice these things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so um, so that's something that we need to understand, right? So we see believers struggling in sin, right? As believers, maybe we struggle in sin. So there is a struggle to overcome certain you know sins in our life and sinful habits, maybe. So it's easy to see such a person and then say that you know this person is is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Or this person is not saved. Right? It's easy for us to pass such a judgment. So we need to understand you know, how is a person saved? How does a person inherit the kingdom of God? Right? How does a person enter into the kingdom of God? It is only by grace through the blood of Jesus. It's very clear: you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified, you are pronounced not guilty, right? By God Himself. So that's how it happens. So. So the thing is that, um, so that is, while that is how we we are washed and justified and pronounced not guilty, and that is the same manner in which we can even lose that standing. Okay, like for example, if you look at Hebrews, um, Hebrews ten, right? Hebrews ten, um, yeah. Hebrews 10 verse 26, right? If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, then no longer remains a sacrifice, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and all that. And then he says, or well, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy, um, you know, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, that's according to the law. Verse 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy? Who's that person? He says, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. Okay. And then here also, the writer is actually encouraging that person. You know, we have, don't cast away your confidence. Uh, you have need of endurance. And we know, you know, we, we know that you are of those who. Uh, who believe to the saving of the soul and who are not, you know, verse 39 talks about that, you know, that you don't draw back into perdition, which means draw back into um, condemnation and hell and so on. So, so that is the thing we need to keep in mind, right? So, they don't, they don't uh, there is a, the reality of it is there, but we cannot judge by external appearances and uh, external struggles. We cannot judge and say, oh, this person. Uh, has reached that point of no return. This person has actually, you know, lost their salvation. You know, um, so that's that's something that we need to understand from this. You know, just a, um, I know it was a kind of uh, you know deviation uh, from what we were looking at, right? 
okay uh what was that prince uh, efficiency one yeah efficiency one about being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light right that is what it talks about okay okay so let's um um let's move on we okay, talks about the guarantee of the redemption right okay okay so let's look at um, uh, you know if we if, if we move on to verse 12 um, he is talking again about warning. He's warning them and talking to them about the dangers of uh, a sin which is of a sexual nature. Okay? So, verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will be brought under the power of any. Right? <laughs> foods for the stomach, stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and also will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, so um, he's warning them against sexual sin. He's he's just now addressed a sexual sin of a very grievous nature, and he says, you know, such kind of sin was not even seen in the Gentiles, but you know, I see it here in the church, and it become a lifestyle. So he has to deal with them very strictly. So he's warning against sexual sin again. So, so the culture, you know, the context is this: the culture in which the church was, the Corinthian church was living, was a lot of things, uh, I mean, the, the culture in which uh, there was prevailing culture in Corinth, in which this, this church was there, it was a very liberal society. A lot of things were permitted, right? Order. And according to the law of the land, it was fine, right? What were some of the things? See, sexual immorality was rampant in the worship itself. Like we, we said, we looked at that in the temple that they had um, in the de worshipping of those deities like there was sexual immorality and the prevailing culture it was also you know you, you can imagine you know if if a family goes to let's say uh, if a man or a woman they go to a temple to worship you know of temple of that day in Corinth to worship which means that Chances are that they will indulge in sexual immorality, right? And it was accepted in the family. So you can see, imagine with what values the children are growing up. Right? It's like, it's fine. So the children, the youth, the adults, everybody has such a very permissive um, you know, outlook about sin. So here is the church and here is Paul you know, teaching them about all this and then you know all kinds of people are coming they are getting born again they are saved and still we know that you know they need to come to a place of maturity they need to clean up their lives and so on so he's saying hey all things could be lawful according to the law of the land according to popular culture tradition whatever but you know these things we will not be brought under the power of any okay um so is um uh, addressing that then also the fact that yes uh, food is for the stomach and stomach for food but god will destroy both it and them right so he's addressing verse 13 he's talking about the appetite of the body yes there is the appetite of the body and uh, it is uh, it is right that there are normal natural appetites and these need to be satisfied within the way God designed because He designed the body, He designed the appetite, and God, you know, the way He provides for those appetites to be fulfilled, 
is in God ordained ways, right? Within the boundaries that God has put together, which we can say are these are legitimate and uh, legitimate ways. Right? So God is saying, uh, so Paul is saying that you know God will put both to an end. All that will come to an end, you know, the appetite and the body, because the body, the appetite should not lead you to sin, right? You don't go about satisfying those needs or satisfying that appetite in God, ways that God did not ordain, right? Um, so any kind of sexual perversion, any kind of sexual immorality says that is not the culture, that is not kingdom culture, right? It could be the culture of that that place right so for us as believers for us to you know even maybe you know we we are sensitized to sexual immorality and and so on but for us to you know ask you know what is it that is allowed in culture right saying okay this is fine right? in it, it is our tradition it is our culture but that is which is disallowed in the word of god right where maybe there is a principle maybe there is a precept uh, in the word of God, which which goes against it, and you know the spirit of this particular truth, which is there in Scripture, is that you know I cannot do this, even though it's allowed in culture. It's not even though it's allowed in the tradition uh, of the family in which I was born into, the culture in which I am living in. You know, we and it's it's very subjective. So we need to ask ourselves because you know if we look at uh, you know our own nation, you know it's it's multi. Uh, cultural, you know, we have. You can't say, okay, this is the culture of India. Yes, we can say certain things, like, but it is, um, uh, it is multi. Yeah, yes, Nina, you have a question. Yeah, please. Can you hear me, Pastor? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to go over the verse nine, uh, yeah. which is talking about a list of those people. Uh, mm -hmm. He was saying that how um, all, many of you were in that category. But right. now you are washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified. Um, but yes. he uh, nine also says that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. So, uh, so when how do we understand that? As uh, I mean, you know, okay, after they have been saved, also uh, mm -hmm. it does not apply. Yes, but then that list yes. does say they will not inherit. So, is right. it talking about people who would continue doing those various things? Right, and is it a, is it a categoric statement because you know so many might come under that category? Mm. Right, right. So, so it's, 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 yeah, sure. Uh, that's a good question because see, verse nine, he very clearly says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right, so uh, we know the difference between okay, whom the Lord calls as righteous and the whom the Lord calls as unrighteous. Right, so we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Um, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus as believers. One Corinthians five, verse twenty one, and then one Corinthians five seventeen also talks about the fact that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. So, so we know know that distinction. So um, the, then the other second question is, you know, uh, do not be deceived. Neither so he's unrighteous, righteous, and he's talking about he's giving a list of unrighteous acts or unrighteous, um, uh, you know, acts which part become part of an unrighteous lifestyle, and he's writing about all these things. Now, when you say you know this idolaters or a reviler or an adulterer, uh, it's it's uh, you know that label is given to someone who is part of uh, it's it's a recurring thing. It's an ongoing thing. It's a it's a lifestyle. It's a habitual thing. Right? So it's it doesn't refer to someone who is struggling in that sin or who's putting up a fight against it, but who's really given into that. It's become part of it. So the danger is that. Uh, so he's saying that such people will not inherit. Right? Um, will will not inherit. Uh, yeah, so he's saying, oh, yeah, these will uh, not the, the, uh, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, so then brings us to that question: you know, Why is it that they will not inherit the kingdom of God? Or is it because they are dabbling in this sin? Why? So the the bigger picture behind that is that it will lead them to a point of being hardened to sin, like we see in you know Hebrews three again. Uh, the deceitfulness of sin hardens them against repentance to God. Because the Holy Spirit is 
obviously drawing us right back to repentance but they are hardened the conscience is seared and they come to a place of even like what we see in hebrews 10 26 29 they come to a place of even rejecting you know all that they by this by which they were saved right um, so that is the possibility so so uh, so that is how we infer it when we when we put this together okay yes a person doing this will not inherit but this is the reason it will lead to a place of rejecting all that christ has done and so therefore you know they will not inherit the kingdom of god yeah hope that helps yeah okay thank you yes pastor right okay yeah any other questions uh, Okay, yeah, Prince, go ahead. Oh, can you hear me, Pastor? Yeah, I can hear, yeah. So it's like uh like extended question uh, for the answer of Nina. Mm. So it's like, yeah, we have seen like as you have explained, like believers who are struggling with their sins will not come under this, right? Mm. But like, how about like what if like if a believer but he is struggling for his lifetime mm. constantly you know falling down mm. twice a day or like you know for two times a day like he, yeah he was not fully overcome it yeah he was dealing with that sin throughout his life and so will it not be like a lifestyle for him and then can he also mm. like how we have uh, spoken like you know like the sin will make the hearts harden like yeah, yeah later they won't even feel like to repent or go back mm -hmm. towards yeah. they feel so hardened towards the sin yeah yeah so it can happen to a believer who are struggling also right it can it can happen so the thing is uh, you know that's why you know um, hebrews 3 also talks about the, that the fact that uh, one can be hardened so much um because of you know sin so so that's why he's talk, addressing to believers you know don't uh, be careful don't be deceived by it so it, it can happen yes so uh, even for a like even for so your question is okay maybe the person is not given into that sin still struggling uh struggling falling you know that whole cycle of sin and defeat and so on but if that person is not careful uh, see what is happening two things are you know happening there that person is getting hardened by you know like what we see in hebrews 3 and uh, verses 12 and 13 right uh, it says uh, you know brethren um, beware brethren let there be lest there be any any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living god okay verse 13 but exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin right so uh, there's that possibility of that being hardened being um, you know deceived to the uh, and having a heart of unbelief to depart from the lord right? so that possibility is there and that possibility is there for someone who is giving over to sin and saying you know I, I don't want no longer want to struggle against it or someone who is struggling and constantly falling because they are also in a place vulnerable place of opening their life to further attack of the enemy where that area of their life you know is oppressed by the enemy or even energized by the enemy right spiritually energized by the powers of darkness um, which means you know they are they are being uh, enslaved right further and further so repeated sin does that in a certain area where there is oppression, you are opening doors for the enemy to step in and and you know create all kinds of damage. So, yes, that is there. So that is why one needs to be careful. Yeah. So can we say or like tell that like uh, that scripture what uh, Paul says like you know like people who pursue these things will not inherit kingdom. That can also like applies to them for believers yeah yeah so, absolutely so he's actually addressing the believers so he's uh, see in, in 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 this particular epistle he's addressing the believers he's also talking about how righteous the distinction between righteous and unrighteous but 
here he is addressing the believers he is warning them um so about again such a possibility happening so so the thing is this the question is you know where does it lead to right even if i'm struggling and getting up and you know having this kind of where where is it leading that believer to what is happening in that believer right the possibility possibility is that he is hardened he is he might be discouraged hardened and feeling helpless to the point of giving up giving up and saying that um, you know this is not for me that like, this is not for me so that is the point where they don't inherit the kingdom of god now can you and i monitor and you know judge and say okay this point a person has reached the point maybe not right we can't because uh, god is able to save to the uttermost and we know that repentance is this one step back right one step towards uh, grace so so that's the so that's the reality of it right does it help prince oh yes first off thank yeah? you okay okay sure okay we'll take a break and then we'll come back